We generally are following the revised common lectionary, which is a set of texts set aside for each Sunday. And today's reading presents the fourth and final reading from the letter to the Hebrews. You may get the sense that it again sounds different or shifts focus in the previous readings we've had, and from the and it does. It is kind of like that final speech the parent gives to the first kid going off to college. Think of all those things that you wanted to say before they go, that you really wanted them to know, telling them you have to listen to me carefully. This is important stuff. In this case, the admonitions include an array of matters basic to Christian living. They include things like mutual love, hospitality, solidarity with prisoners, sexual morality, wealth, community leaders, and generosity. As I start reading, listen, there are two of the admonitions that will be introduced by a phrase, <clears throat> do not neglect. And two are introduced by remember. Most, not all, are given a brief rationale. And a few really do echo the major themes of the book, the letter of Hebrews. Much like the parents' desperate last words, they are kind of a potiporium of freestanding, undeveloped exhortations. Yet they, as a package, represent social cohesion and accumulatively have an effect. So let us listen to God's word for us, God's lecture to us before we go off on our, into our world, as it comes from Hebrews chapter 13, verses 1 through 8 and 15 and 16. Let mutual love, let mutual affection continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing that, some have entertained angels without knowing it. Remember those who are in prison as though you were in prison with them. Those who are being tortured as though you yourselves were being tortured. Let marriage be held in honor by all and let the marriage bed be kept undefiled for God will judge the sexual immoral and adulterers. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. So, you. so we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can anyone do to me? Remember your leaders, those who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Through him then, let us continually offer a sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of the lips that confess his name. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, praise to you, O Christ. Actually, it would not be true to the text if we only hear these admonitions just as an individualistic way. What I am supposed to do, what you are to do. Instead, from the beginning to the end, these admonitions are for the community. They offer a compelling picture of what the church, our church, also might look like in the current day. And I think they offer, the text offers wisdom for the ages for the churches. In particular, as we continue to emerge from our pandemic, the pandemic has been a formative experience for us with its lockdowns, its challenges to our structure and continu continuation of church community and its challenges for us to witness and share the gospel message to the world. These admonitions are well worth considering for both we as individuals and we as a community. So let's think about them in both ways as how 
we handle these individually, but even more importantly, how do we handle these admonitions as a community? Now, the first admonition is let mutual love remain. Love brothers and sisters. In the early church, all in the community were considered to be sisters and brothers. This is a practice both in language and lifestyle. It continues with us today when we talk about our sisters and brothers in Christ. Early Christians, however, were known and sometimes ridiculed because of their fictive kinship, this idea that all are brothers and sisters. However, maintaining this practice conveys the theological conviction that members are all children of God, whom we call our Father. It also reflected that the early Christians experienced rejection even from their own true kin. We can experience such rejection even from those we love and admire. The clear admonition to continue to practice mutual love is not unique to the book of Hebrews. But in Hebrews, mutual love is a shorthand for practices and tendencies that preserve and strengthen the community. The hope is that the community will stir one another toward love and good deeds. We are to remember that mutual love is an important and tangible consequence consequence of continuing to meet together and continuing to care and share for each other. The, the second admonition deals with hospitality in a, in a broad sense. Hospitality includes not becoming so, becoming an insular community focused just on ourselves, just on themselves. They are not to neglect or overlook the practice of hospitality to all. They cannot forget to love the known and the stranger as well. Recalling the story of Abraham and Sarah reminds of the potential to entertain angels when entertaining strangers. Hospitality really has a central place in the Bible. For example, in the time, biblical times before Motel 6, hospitality played a significant role in expanding and connecting early church communities. Both the Gospels and the letters show the expectation for extending hospitality to transient Christian workers. The general practice is given nuance in Hebrews. Hebrews envisions continuation of the sojourners like Abraham and other heroes of the faith, seeking to extend the community of the faith. Showing and receiving hospitality would thus be a vital component for the growth and connection to, of the future church. <clears throat> the next challenge is the responsibility to express solidarity with two groups of people, those who are imprisoned and those who are being mistreated. We know that prisons in the first century Roman world were dawning places, crowded and dark, prisoners often bound and abused. Family and friends were expected to provide needed sustenance and goods for survival of the prisoners. All sisters and brothers were to be remembered in their time of trials. We should then understand the commandment to remember those in prison as more than just a mental exercise, as important as it may be, more than just prayer. Unfortunately, we still have prisons of many types today, but we can observe that our prisons take many different forms today. Forms as identified by our commitment to the PCUSA Matthew 25 program and the envision the vision there to eradicate systemic poverty by working for change, change laws, policies, plans, and structure in our society to perpetuate economic exploitation. And a second, to dismantle structural racism by advocating and acting to break down the systems, practices, and thinking that underlie discrimination, bias, prejudice, and oppression. We must remember and continue to act on our commitment 
to the imprisoned and the mistreated, even in our day. The next three admonitions relate to communities, maintenance, and integrity. As Luke Johnson notes in his commentary, there's a long tradition of treating sexual and economic behavior in tandem, since both point to an excessive or disordered desires. Such excessive desires, whether money or sexual relations, have disastrous effect on communal life. With little fanfare or explanation comes the admonition to honor marriage and to keep the marriage bed undefiled. It is simply stated, God will judge the sexual, immoral, and it alters. Perhaps no more needs to be said about this in our off-to-college speech. Nevertheless, excessive, exclusive purity in, of the marriage relationship remains a clear instruction. Maintaining sexual morality remains a clear instruction. More said about restraint, restraint in other areas of life that the econo- that of one is, more is said is about the economic practices. The leading admonition admonition is to adopt a lifestyle that does not include love of money. This love of money is a vice commended almost universally by the popular philosophers in the ancient world. It's actually the not to love money was commended by a lot of the philosophers of that time. Love of money can lead to greed and hoarding not just of money itself, but of resources of all types. The opposite of love of money, or at least its corresponding virtue, is contentment. Practicing being content with what one has is is to tamp down the desire to accumulate and earn more and more. Contentment enables the community to share possessions, which is acknowledged as pleasing to God. Think of the context. Ancient house churches consisted of a few wealthy and quite a few not so wealthy. In this context, as in ours, the emphasis was to lie on accepting what God had provided. A lack of gratitude or grasping for more wealth for the sake of wealth itself should not color our lives. The final admonition is to remember their leaders. When this was written, this could have actually included direct witnesses to Jesus. This could have been people who heard directly from him the gospel message and then later shared that with the communities. These leaders are to be remembered, not just for their potential role in founding the community, but also for the quality of their lives. The admonition is to consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Remember the leaders. The next statement seems to just appear. It is Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. <clears throat> seems like it stands for rather independent leaders then and now may come and go. But Jesus Christ. You may note that the lectionary actually skipped verses 9 through 14. These include some fascinating but complicated material about strange teachings, altars, sanctuaries, blood, and city gates. I'm going to take the prerogative to leave these for you for your own reading as the homework assignment. But as Christopher Holmes points out, the cultic content
taxes. Okay. There, the important change from these activities of the Old Testament style of worship is the activities do not require the literal use of blood or the loss of life. Instead, their activities are spiritualized, sacrificial system in which we can all participate. No more whole animal sacrifices with blood on the altar. Hence, the final verses, verses end up with two types of sacrifices, offering by the inclusive band of priests, all of us. The first sacrifice is constant praise. The second, quote, sacrifice is doing good and sharing possessions. Well, the final parental speech to the Hebrews is ended. They are off to college or off to their lives on their own. The question is, will they remember the admonitions? Will they remember that a congregation's vitality should not be measured by the abundance of its programming or the flashiness of its preacher or the decibels of its music? Will they remember that a congregation's vitality depends on the demonstration of deep love, radical hospitality, solidarity with those in the margins of society, honoring marriage, sharing but not idolizing money and possessions, practicing contentment, and emulating the exemplary behavior of those who have gone before them. Let us pray that all, including ourselves, remember these admonitions. Let us pray that we all see this modeled in our own community. We can accept that the text from Hebrews presents a model for the off to school or off into the world speech. But we know this message will not be effective to the degree to the degree we want if it is not lived by the speaker in the community. Perhaps our closing admonition should actually go back to the famous words attributed to Francis of Assisi, where he's quoted to have said, preach the gospel at all times. Use words if necessary. Amen. Oh,